And then also uh, priority number six, which was to include a broad range of mechanisms to support compliance. Uh, we heard this several times in, in our panel on day two, um, but we also heard this from several of the participants uh, across the region um, today as well. And really compliance, um, Joanna put it well, if, if you are gonna have regulations out there, um, but you can't uh, actually regulate those or, or monitor and comply and, and ensure compliance, um, that's another, another difficult uh, area to assess. Um, so I'll shift real quick to our, uh, to our Mexico discussion. Um, uh, Adiel Perez uh, provided some insights um, on Mexico specifically, and he said that a lot of the same sort of issues that Joanna has seen in, in Bermuda are, are shared in Mexico as well. Uh, he highlighted that those seven recommendations are are not just about each individual, but also about the process. Um, so very much walking through uh, each of those seven uh, and being, being able to talk about those seven pieces with the key stakeholders and decision makers um, in those fisheries in those countries. Uh, and I thought that was a really valuable point is, is the process is, is so key. Um, but as far as his priority number ones, um, number two was, or his number one was, uh, recommendation number two, which is again, develop a, a policy statement um, and have really clear uh, goals defined by those, uh, those partners um, and the decision makers in those fisheries. Um, his second was uh, talking about recommendation number three to really provide cooperation with stakeholders, um, especially as it relates to those policies in those uh, recreational fishing management plans. Uh, and also um, recommendation number one to, just like Joanna said, to really highlight the socio-ecological importance of those fisheries, um, not just understand them, but also recognize them. Uh, next, uh, Leopoldo um, also provided some insight from uh, Mexico. Uh, and he said, in some cases, there's some really good rec there's some really good regulations in place, um, but many of those are not enforced. Uh, and, and he said, also looking at the seven recommendations, they're all really high priority. Um, it's a good list. Uh, but he said, uh, along the lines of what um, Adiel provided, is that the plans there have been some sport fishing plans that have been developed over the years um, and updated uh, on a frequent basis. And he said those need updated again. Uh, that's a key piece to keep bringing these stakeholders back to the table. Um, he said under recommendation, recommendation number three, um, cooperating with the relevant stakeholders. Uh, within government, that's also important because there's uh, there are different ministries or groups that manage um, protected areas like CONAM, um, and then other ministries that, that manage the fishery itself like CONAPESCA. So it's not just about bringing outside stakeholders all to the same table but also bringing some of those internal stakeholders across ministries um, to the same table as well. Uh, and then he also highlighted number four, the ecological and economic impacts um, as really important. Uh, there's, especially in the area where he works, there's a few very specific species um, that are targeted by the recreational fishery, but there's not a lot of um, local science uh, and understanding of, of um, patterns of movement um, the catch rates uh, and some of the participation rates as well. Um, we didn't get a chance to dive into the regional uh, breakout, but we are going to have uh, the folks from that uh, from that workshop um, send us their comments um, so that we can all kind of share those across the participants in that breakout group uh, and be able to roll those into the uh, into the final report. So I will turn it over to Valerie um, to provide the Cuba report out. And like I said, for anybody that was in the regional breakout, if there's anything that I left off, um, feel free to type that in the chat. I didn't leave anything off on purpose. Uh, there was just a lot of information flying around. Over to you, Valerie. Thanks, Sepp. Um, it's great to hear that regional uh, report out. I'm happy to share some points from 
partners in Cuba that you met in the earlier days that served as panelists. They're actually hosting um, kind of two breakout rooms right now and the discussion's continuing. It's uh, too difficult to connect to Zoom, so I'll be the, the messenger in this case. Um, so there was, uh, in both rooms, um, real uh, interest and excitement that the new fisheries law in Cuba provides more clarity around the sector and more opportunities for um, science-based management of recreational fisheries alongside commercial fisheries. Um, folks in the Cuba group highlighted a, a few different new projects that are um, starting or in the process of, of being approved that they think will provide um, some new international collaborations and, and opportunities to focus more on recreational fisheries through these new projects. Um, they also discussed um, the need to better share the new definitions of recreational fishing that are in the law with a wider public through educational campaigns and through different materials. So um, there is interest in, you know, making sure all of those concepts of what recreational fisheries is now defined as and who participates and how you participate is part of uh, an educational campaign. Um, there's also discussion around the need to evaluate the demand for recreational fishing opportunities. Um, they see a lot of potential in Cuba because there's so many local recreational fishers and, um, and because of, uh, you know, the numerous local ports and boats um, that could contribute to this opportunity. Um, and there's a recommendation to do kind of a study of, of demand within Cuba and outside Cuba to better know uh, what are the possibilities for recreational fishing. It's um, complicated and so that that type of study I think could shine a light a lot of light on um, what's what's the potential for this sector. Um, let's see, I'm going through the notes here. Similarly to understanding the opportunity, there is also a discussion around the need to improve research on social, ecological, and economic impacts. That's point number four in the, in the list that you're referencing, Sep. Um, both groups discussed the need for building on some um, pilot research sites in Cuba where there's been a lot of collaboration between uh, tourism entities with local scientists and researchers to know the um, to know more about the key recreational fisheries and the habitat of those species. And I think there's uh, folks see an opportunity to increase that type of collaboration and, and research in other places. Um, there's also interest in, in discussion around thinking about uh, specific management measures for key species like Tarpon, permit, snook, macavi, um, and under this new law, think about what opportunities are there for uh, regulations that are are focused on the fisheries that are most important for the recreational sector. And then let's see here. Uh, lastly, and and kind of connected to those last two points. Um, there was a discussion in both breakout groups of, of Cuban experts around the need for improved data collection on the fisheries. So that's point number eight. Um, both groups saw the need for greater collaboration with the international tourism that's taking place around recreational fishing to support data collection. Um, and kind of starting that type of collaboration from the beginning, you know, when it when it's part of the mechanisms to uh, award licenses, um, when you're starting research to make sure folks that are involved in international tourism activities 
have this connection to data collection and, and the monitoring that, that could take place for those particular species and, and those activities. Uh, those are the, the main points I have now. Um, and uh, I'm sure they'll, they'll be sharing more after this discussion since they're, they're continuing the, the talk for now. So um, thanks for giving this space for me to share these messages and um, I'll be happy to answer questions and add more notes after this plenary. Thanks, Valerie. And we've got a question from Will. We'll we'll tackle um, here shortly after uh, after the report out from the Bahamas. Um, I believe Vanessa was going to try, and I think you've been promoted to panelist now, Vanessa. Hi. Yes. Can you hear me? Sounds good. All right. I'm going to make a stab at this. Sarah will be my backup in the event that I have technical difficulties. Um, the workshop, I, it, it was like running a 50 meter dash sprint. <laughs> um, some great information uh, came out, represented in our group. We had representation from BAMZ, which is uh, um, the Bahamas Agriculture Marine Institute. And uh, we also had two guys um, participating in the group. We had Benjamin Pratt from uh, the Ministry of Tourism and myself and Chris was all also there so we had that scientific uh, representation as well so I do think that the the comments um, is a broad representation of um, the industry so in terms of our highest priorities we identified number two four and six is high and I'll walk through them and and give you a little idea as to why so the first um, is developing a policy statement, which clearly articulates the plans and intentions relating to recreational fishery. Um, we think that this was important in creating the framework for the recreational fishery. Although there are two different um, types of legislation, one guiding the offshore recreational fishery, I'll refer to it as that, and then the other that guides the flat fishing recreational fishery. Um, and we think that, that both definitely need to come together and this can be accomplished through a uh, policy statement. The next step would be to reach out to the respective stakeholders across both fisheries, um, as well as um, the, the guides as well to play a role in this. Let's see. Right, there's a need for alignment between the flats and offshore regulations, as I, I specified before, and who can drive this. We think that it should be definitely a collaborative effort amongst all stakeholders. Um, there'll be a challenge having one person or group leading, but we think that definitely the Ministry of Agriculture and Marine Resources could bring the different sectors together to discuss. Um, the next top priority was number four, which is monitoring the biological, economic, and social impacts of the recreational fishery. Um, we can use existing data. Uh, we can consolidate the data. We need to collect data um, with respect to the offshore recreational fishery. I'm not familiar with extensive studies being done in this regard, so we do believe that this is critical. This is a critical first step in um, carrying forth with the recreational management plan because we have to know um, what exists so we can identify uh, potential gaps. And we think that at least one focal person can spearhead the next steps and that could potentially be Department of Marine Resources. Um, you know, I get a little bit uh, nervous um, allocating all of these to the Department of Marine Resources because we have to be realistic that they also have um, limited capacity um, um, and resources to carry this out. BAMZ also indicated that they can um, support this particular goal, uh, but we may also need to include the Department of Environmental Planning and Protection, and that's formally known as the BEST Commission. Uh, the next high priority was number six, which includes a broad range of mechanisms to support compliance activities. Now, I have to say that in our existing legislation for the flat fishery, there is some mention of um, being able to allocate fisheries officers um, 
potentially guides. I think that was the concept behind it to assist in compliance because they would have the vote. They, they, they understand the resource and they can potentially help. However, Krista mentioned that um, when they try to do similar uh, uh, warden system uh, to, to, to for the, uh, I guess, the grouper fishery, um, that had, that, that was met with a little bit of resistance and how it was just in terms of how that would be framed. And so we know that we need to continue having the discussion just, you know, what would this framework look like if we were to assign guides as what in, in terms of compliance um, for the regulations that already exist. And then we know that there's no mention of it at all in terms of the offshore recreational fishery. So the two have to come together. Um, there needs to be discussions with the relevant ministries. We also think that we need to look at case studies in the region to identify a broader set of mechanisms to increase um, compliance and support enforcement. So where else um, in, in the region is this being done that you can put on and need to identify um, or define models for a comprehensive monitoring and enforcement, uh, enforcement across all sectors. There are some close medium that, that comes up in terms of priorities. Uh, number one, which is assess and recognize the socio-ecological importance of the recreational fisheries and be required. Um, cooperating with relevant stakeholders to develop the management plans. We think that the three high priorities can help flow into that. Um, implement cost recovery strategies. Uh, we do have some type of funding mechanisms where um, fees goes into the, to the conservation fund and consolidated funds. Um, with respect to the offshore sport fishing, there are some fees that are charged for sport fishing tournaments. However, there's no mention um, with respect to uh, where those fees go um, and if that fee, if the fees can um, flow back into the conservation and management of the, of the, of the fishery. So that needs to be discussed. And also claim governance in the context of a changing environment and climate change and, and, and adaptive planning. So we think those provisions can be included into uh, a nice robust climate plan. So those are the findings from the group. Um, if any um, of the participants in, in my group wanted to add anything um, that they think that I didn't, they can certainly um, Thanks so much, Vanessa. Um, I see Valerie went in and, and answered uh, Will's question in the Q&A. So hopefully um, that uh, answered your question for now, Will. Um, well, everybody, uh, this brings us to the end of our workshop and the end of our special session. Um, I want to uh, I want to first say, you know, one of the really interesting findings that we heard several times this week, um, both throughout the panels, the discussions, and also this workshop, uh, is the need for more knowledge sharing um, and collaboration around some of these shared issues. Uh, one of the main reasons that EDF continues to work with GCFI is that they are such a, a sound um, learning network and a, a really strong community throughout the Gulf and Caribbean. Um, and so one of the key follow-ups from this week is, is to continue exploring with GCFI as well as the rest of you all, um, how we can maintain some of the momentum that we gained in this special session uh, and perhaps formalize uh, more of this learning network around recreational fisheries management. Um, so hopefully this is just the start of, of something beautiful. Um, and of course, uh, hopefully uh, we'll get to see everybody in person uh, next year. Uh, high hopes. Um, but uh, for now, I feel like this has been a, a great special session. In closing, uh, I'll turn it over to Fadila here in a second. But I just want to thank uh, GCFI for helping host and coordinate all the details for this event. Um, planning an in-person event takes a lot of work. I think planning a digital event takes almost more work. Um, Adila and Alejandro, uh, you've been absolute saints to work with, uh, really hardworking saints, I should say. Um, to our translators, gracias por todo, merci beaucoup, 
Danke schön, obrigado, thank you. Uh, you have been incredible. Without uh, you, none of this would have been possible. Uh, thanks to Warren Potts for his keynote um, and for his ongoing research on this subject. I also want to thank the audience for joining each day uh, and a huge thank you to all the panelists and workshop participants uh, for all your time. Um, I want to remind everybody to keep an eye peeled for the updates and announcements um, regarding the public release of the report and the proceedings from this session. Uh, and lastly, for those that want to continue any of these recreational fisheries conversations, um, we will have a happy hour slash networking event um, immediately after this session uh, in case you want to stick around and that will be on this same Zoom link. Um, so thanks everybody and I will turn it over to you, Fadila. Hello everyone. Um, so yes, I think Sep went about and thanks everyone so I will thank him because he and Lalo have been really great. It's been a really great session um, based on all the discussions and the chat and all the questions that were asked. We can really show, we can really see that this was an important um, conversation that needed to be had. And we are going to continue to work together to put together this report. And we will be sharing with all of you who are registered for this conference, as well as anyone who is interested. So thank you again, and I would also like to thank again all our different panelists and our keynotes from the session, as well as most importantly um, for this multilingual uh, session, our interpreters who were really great. Vivian and Sylvia have been amazing um, during the week. So thank you to Vivian and Sylvia and also to our tech support team, Deanna and Mauricio. Um, thank you both to them. And as this is coming to a close of our technical session, I would like to thank everyone for tuning in um, for the week. It's been a great week. We've had some diverse topics. We've had some diverse sessions. So I hope you all enjoy that. We're not completely done. We still have our story slam and our closing ceremony and social later today. So feel free to join at 5 p.m. Um, Eastern time. Um, as I continue with all the thank yous, I'd also like to thank the GCFI um, planning committee. They've done a um, really great job. It's a lot of, um, it's a great team that put this conference together and I hope you all um, enjoyed it. I will uh, see if Alejandra has anything to add. I'm not sure if Alejandra is still here. Adila? Yes, Scott. Yeah. Uh, hey, did uh, I missed some of the stuff early in the week? Did y'all uh, ring the bell virtually? Um, the at the opening ceremony, we um, played a video of Leroy from last year ringing the bell, and then at our closing ceremony today, we will um, officially close GCFI. Good. I, I, I'd like to hear that. I like tradition. <laughs> so tune in later today um, to. Uh, witness the official close of GCFI. So it's day at 5 p.m. Eastern time. So those are a lot of thank yous and I think um, we must also thank our audience. Uh, it's been great. We've met some really interesting people virtually throughout this week and hopefully we can all uh, meet in person um, next year. That would be great. And yes, just a general thank you and stay tuned. We'll be sending more emails and follow-ups afterwards. And hopefully I will see you all later today. So back over to set to transition into our happy hour. Thanks, Fadila. Um, I know it's still pretty early in all these zones, um, but there's no judgment at GCFI. Uh, so if anybody wants to grab a, a coffee with some Baileys or anything else, um, feel free to stick around. Might be a little hectic because I think everybody's going to have a chance to talk or, or chat um, through that function. Uh, but uh, yeah, stick around if you want to continue some of these conversations. Thanks, Fadila. Thank you, Seth.